I start this second meeting with some commenting on the homework. There were exercises 1.2.1, 1.2.2. You see them here. They have exclamation marks. It means everybody should know the result. They give elementary relation between preference relation and representing function. I will say no more about it. I move on to exercise 1.2.3. It has an exclamation mark again. It's written that it's only for C students, but this may also be nice for A and B students to try. I would recommend. This is really an exercise in logic, logical thinking. And being exposed to that is good for the brains of everybody. So I can advise everybody to work on it. Also, you get a better feeling for preference relations. This is good for this course anyhow. This is part E. If I didn't work on it for a while, I don't, it takes me some time also to find it again. So it's non-trivial, but it's really a good exercise worth trying. I move on to exercise 1.2.4. It's uh, there's no exclamation mark, but still I call you attention. It's quite useful. That means if you have two prospects, then you can always rewrite in such a way that they involve the same event petition. Now, as a solution, I will only say them vague words. But what you do is you take every uh, intersection of one event of one petition and one event of the other petition. Then here, friends, you get k times l intersection several of them may be empty no problem at all but then you get events an event partition that each prospect can be written uh, both of them can be written with respect to that event partition and that can that's often convenient and uh, in part b of the exercise it even has shown that if it's not for a two prospect for any finite number of prospects you can do the same just by repeatedly doing what i just said that's often convenient you know that you can use one in your notation one event partition so that's a little bit of a useful result. Then exercise 1.3.1, and that is here. It's just a matter of expected value maximization. And I know from experience that especially students with some mathematical sophistication, they feel that they are underestimated here. What is this, you know, calculating expected value, we can do much better. But still, I advise you, trust your teacher, it's useful for you to do it because what comes automatically is from doing such exercise, you get the feeling how decision models are related to actual preferences, to decision making, to empirical reality. It's a sort of a principle underlying this whole course that everything is made operational for every uh, theoretical construct, uh, the thing, uh, immediately it is linked to empirical reality. So you get a real feeling how these things are. And I know, for instance, from experience that so they can be economic students, they are very sophisticated. They can resolve very difficult optimization problems. First order optimality condition, they can tell you all about it. But then you tell them, now let's assume that we do expected value maximization. Here are two prospects, which would you choose? And then they look at you, they don't know what you're talking about because they don't know how these decision models are related to empirical reality. So to avoid that, I think, more or less subconsciously, it does give you a better understanding if you just do this exercise. So just go through them and it's good for you. <laughs> so that's where there's more going on in these exercises, maybe that first meets the eye. So exercise 1.3.2 is similar in nature. I want to go on to exercise 1.4.1. That's still uh, like the story, but here a bit more, it's also just expected value maximization, but here a bit more is going on. Here we assume, so we assume a model expected value, but now here we first assume some empirical observations, in this case, three indifferences. Then we use our theoretical model to derive uh, calibrate parameters, whatever from it, in this case, subjective probabilities of events. Then we can use that to predict, make empirical predictions. This pattern is typical of the same effect of all empirical sciences. All empirical science, you're assuming some model, some theory, you do some observations, and you use that to predict further observation, to derive further observation. It's a pattern of all empirical sciences. But if you do this exercise, you really, again, like I said before, you get a better feeling of what these models mean, and it's the operational spirit of this course. So that's why these exercises are there also for sophisticated students. Then I go on to exercise 1.6.1. Scroll a bit, and there it is. 
So here we uh, you are supposed to make a Dutch book against a max min decision making. And maybe you're asking yourself, in a Dutch book, how can I make this? Should I just randomly be trying all kinds of things? That can take a long time. But a general principle that can help you to make Dutch books is that usually if the Dutch book can be made against a preference system, it means there's a sort of irrationality in a preference system. So to find that book, you take up preference on a situation where they are irrational, where they are doing silly things. Now your max min is silly because a max min person is only looking at the minimum outcome and ignoring all the other outcomes. So then that, that is, for instance, you take them up on choice situation where this is stupid. You take all kind of preferences where the preferred prospect has the min, min outcome a bit better than the dispreferred outcome, because that's what the max min is. But then the other outcome are wholly ignored. So then the dispreferred prospects for the non-minimal outcome, you have to be very high, uh, billions of dollars. And the preferred prospect for the non-minimal, they're just smaller, maybe uh, almost the same as the minimum outcome. That's in such preference situations, max min is doing silly. So if you set up a few of such preference situation and quickly you get a Dutch book. So that's in general a sort of principle to how you can find Dutch books, a general principle. And maybe if you already did this at homework, you want to try to get a bit more, you could try to do it for max, max optimization, if you can guess what that means. But that's how it goes in general. Now I move on to exercise 1.6.5. That's the next I want to say something about. And that exercise probably only see students, but still for everybody, the result is actually quite interesting. Proper scoring rules written there. What we do there, let's look at part A. Assume you do subjective expected value maximization and you're using your subjective probabilities, your degrees of belief, the other people may not know them. And then you play this game, you calculate which number R will you choose there that's best for you. And if you did the homework exercise, maybe see students, you found it ha as it so happens, R should be equal to your subjective probability. So that's the result. And maybe you shock your shoulders and you say, so what? But this has enormous implications. It means that with this game, you can very quickly, efficiently measure the degrees of belief of people. So this is, for instance, used much with weather forecasting. Weather forecasts have uh, to say every day what the probability of rain tomorrow is and things like that. It is their subjective probability based on their big expertise. Then these scoring rules are used to teach uh, these weather forecasts how to handle subjective probability as well. Maybe if one weather forecast is not scoring very well on this scoring rule, then things are going wrong, may not be calibrated, we're not explaining. But these weather forecasts are using such scoring systems to learn and to improve. And anyway, with this scoring, this game, you can very quickly read the mind of a person. So I would say that the results you get from this are more interesting than measurements that you can get from uh, results from neural measurements, for instance. They're much cheaper to get. So this is this is very, you know, uh, people are spending all their life studying proper scoring rules and use them in many applications. So in that sense, this is a really a nice result. And finally, a bit about the uh, of exercise 1.6.6. Now let me say something about that. In this exercise, you can sort of see that the moment you are risk averse, book can be made against you. And I tried my utmost best to convince you that for moderate amounts of money, book against you is socio irrational. That means for moderate amounts of money, you should not be risk averse. I hope you don't mind this paternalistic tone, which is in this course on prescriptive normative theories. This will often happen. But that is, for moderate amounts of money, don't be risk averse. So that's something that this exercise can further make salient underscore. Finally, I go to assignment 1.6.8, but I will not show the solution, but the rule, and there is no solution back of the book, so you're on your own in that regard. But uh, a general, if you really just try to solve it by yourself, it's not so easy. You can do it, but it's not so easy. But if you know the rule of the game, that is uh, that all the results in the book proceeding can be used. Then if you use theorem 1.6.1, especially statement one and three there, this exercise becomes very easy. Uh, this assignment becomes very easy. Okay, that was all I wanted to say about the homework. And then the next recording, I will start uh, on a new theory.